Australians have an enduring love of home ownership and many eagerly explore ways to fast track their accumulation of wealth through property investment. Some are so passionate about real estate that they chase the dream of getting up their day job to flip houses, live off the rent from their growing property portfolio, even become a buyer's agent, or in some cases start educating others about their pathway to success. There appears to be no end to the thirst that do-it-yourself investors have for proven methods and exclusive access to the next location that's set to take off. Which leads me to the question, is there such a thing as the secret to property success? And if it can be bottled up, what would it be worth? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and buyer's agent mentor, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, author of Auction Ready and co-host of Your First Home Buyer Guide. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, recently ranked number five in Australia out of over 18,000 brokers in the annual MPA Top 100 Mortgage Broker Award. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of an appropriate and experienced professional. PK Gupta is our guest today. PK has a popular YouTube channel and has created a course designed to teach property investors how to DIY. He's vocal in saying you don't need to pay a buyer's agent if you can learn to do it yourself. His background is in financial markets and he's used his number crunching skills to uncover what he pitches as a secret to combining capital growth and cash flow. And if you think this sounds familiar, it's probably because it is a compelling sales pitch used by many property strategists, buyers, agents, and even spruikers. So we're keen to find out how PK has cracked the code. We're guessing he won't want to reveal exactly what's in his secret sauce recipe, but we're sure that he'll share some case studies that we can unpack. Thank you so much for joining us today, PK. Thanks for having me on, Chris and Veronica. Okay, thanks for coming on, mate. Um, I know you were chatting to Veronica about um, and asking her whether she was game to get you on the podcast. Um, what did you mean by that? I guess, um, yeah, what, what's... Uh... Yeah, no, I'm super appreciative. And, and actually, I, like I was saying to Veronica and when we connected over that correspondence as well, there's, there's not so many buyers, agents who are willing to have like a, just an open and honest conversation about both the pitfalls of courses, DIY, spruikers, and also buyers agents themselves. And so, like I was saying to Veronica, it seems like months ago now, um, that I've always respected um, you guys from afar because, I mean, as the very name of this podcast suggests, Elephant in the Room, you actually think about um, yeah, things that aren't often thought about and aren't often discussed. And I actually stumbled upon, Veronica, one of your um, articles, and I think it was your property investment magazine or something like that, when you actually wrote a piece around, you know, the, the pros and cons, and you know, there's always pros and cons to anything, of like local buyers agents and interstate buyers agents and, and, and things like that. So yeah, it was really, it's really cool that you, that you can have this conversation to like an audience who's obviously um, through you guys and probably others is, is fairly attuned to the matter. Oh, I think our audience is definitely attuned to it. <laughs> They've heard me go on about it enough. I mean, you do sling a lot of arrows at buyers agents, and and I don't disagree with many of your points, actually. Um, and certainly, as I mentioned, I've been very outspoken about where I feel there are gaps in our industry. But I guess I'm coming at it from a position of caring about my profession from and caring about the consumer as well. Um, whereas I think your criticism is probably part of your marketing pitch, right? Which means that that if you are saying that, look, buyers agents aren't really worth paying fifteen grand for. By the way, I would charge more than that, but and you know, a lot do. But you know, if buyers agents aren't worth pay, pitching, uh, paying fifteen grand for, if you can do it yourself, which means that you're posing an alternative, right? So I guess that you know, be I keen to understand, you know, what you where you really see your alternative stacks up against um, a good buyer's agent. And I guess let's let's distinguish because I don't disagree with you about a lot of buyer's agents that are out there. I think that a, a buyer's agent needs to be experienced, needs to have local knowledge and also needs to give a damn about their client and do appropriate due diligence. So without doing that, then I do agree a lot of people would be better off doing it themselves. So um, I guess, you know, if you're saying that your offer is better though, let's see if it stands up to scrutiny. So are you okay with that? Yeah, let let's go for it. And I should perhaps I should also um, preface by just sort of saying that you, your intro was 
That's very good. Um, but I don't actually profess to have any secrets, and, and I often talk about in my Facebook group and, and YouTube that people should actually try to do it themselves. Like, you don't need to pay someone $6,000 on a course. You don't actually need to pay someone $15,000 or 10 or 20 whatever it is, on a buyer's agent. There's like a, a sliding scale. You know, you try to do it yourself if you can, you know, through the requisite means of acquiring knowledge from different sources. If you can't because of a lack of education or lack of confidence or whatever the case may be, then perhaps the next hurdle is, okay, well, can I acquire the right systematic sort of structured education and mentorship? And then if that's not going to get you over the line because of whatever reason, then buyer's agents are an obvious solution. And I should also say that I have nothing against buyer's agents, good buyer's agents, that is like as part of my course, and I'm sure there's other course creators who have produced buyer's agents as well. We've, we've produced more than 75 really ethical buyer's agents, like exactly what you said, people who have good character, they actually care about their clients and they're actually competent. Those three C's are, are very important in my mind. So I have nothing against buyer's agents. I think the the point of view that I'm trying to espouse, and I'm a little bit outspoken about, um, and of course things can be taken out of context, is that there is over the last five years, I would say, almost like a, a wave of buyer's agents patting themselves on, on the back, and it kind of becomes like this self-fulfilling prophecy. And because, like, let's face it, I mean, I know Chris is here, but 95% of property content is dominated by buyer's agents. It almost seems to be the case that um, you need to have a buyer's agent. That like that seems to be, at least in my mind and those people who, who kind of vibe with, with what I'm saying, it seems to be the rhetoric that, hey, you'd be crazy to try to do it yourself or you better not take that risk because you won't be able to get those off-market opportunities or there's no way you'll ever be able to negotiate as well as I can. So if you're buying a 500K property, forget 20, 25K, that's peanuts in terms of what we can negotiate for you. I know you, you, this is not what you necessarily do, Veronica, I'm just sort of generalizing here, but that's kind of where I'm, where I'm coming from and trying to level the playing field, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's the, so what, in your view though, where does it, the line finish, right? Where does it go that a great buyer's agent really adds value for their fee? Yeah. So my, I did a, a session, I did a debate with a, a really good buyer's agent as well. And he hasn't paid me to say this, um, um, on pizza and property podcast. And we kind of got to the conclusion after thrashing it around for, for a long time that if you genuinely, A, don't have any passion for property, which kind of leads to B, you don't really want to learn anything about it. And C, if you don't have even five hours a week, you know, for a couple of months to dedicate to both learning and execution of buying a property, then you should probably outsource, right? That is the kind of ingredients, those three ingredients. You don't have those three, then outsource it. Um, that is what I strongly believe. And that's what I've kind of, at least <laughs> you may or may not believe it, but that's what I've sort of proven with more than a thousand clients, more than 2000 properties bought. We can go into results and all that sort of thing if you want to. But that's kind of, that's kind of my thesis, right? Um, it's something that can be learned. It's, it's a teachable skill. It's not like surgery. It's not like an electrician. You don't need to be overly qualified to do it. More than 90, 95% of people perhaps don't use a buyer's agent and they've done just well. They're just fine for the last 40, 50 years, but everyone uses an electrician if they need to. Everyone gets a surgeon. They don't like operate on themselves. So it is a professional industry, but it's a different type of profession. Um, and what I'm sort of keep reiterating is that it's, it's learnable. So do you think that there's zero value add into the relationship that that agent has with a buyer's agent, right? And the trust that they form over many years to be able to talk to that buyer's agent a little bit more openly than they would to the average punter in the street. And do you think that there's any type of benefit, relationship benefit that you won't get, even if you learn, you know what to buy, where to buy, you can't just all of a sudden manufacture a relationship with an agent. So do you believe that there is, an, is a relationship benefit that buyer's agents do have? Um, because if, you, if you're right, if you love property, you're interested in it and you're dedicating the time, you still don't get the relationship benefit of that. Do you think there's a value there or not? 100%. I think relationship, you know, anyone who's bought 
any number of properties sort of very quickly comes to the realization that, you know, data is fantastic, all the right strategies and tactics and mechanics of what to do, how to do it. That's all, that's all great. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like who you know, not just what you know. Um, so relationships have like an immense a role in the property buying process, not just to get good deals that may not be on market, but also to negotiate really well and create a good solid win-win situation with the vendor and with the sales agent. Once again, I come back to, and I honestly didn't believe myself when I first started investing, like, because I mean, back then in 2010, 11, there wasn't so many podcasts like this. Like, I don't know how you, how long you guys have been going. It was content was more sparse than than what it is now. But there was still these sorts of um, this sort of messaging. And even I was like, you know, there is no way that if Veronica has been best friends with an agent, let's say for ten years, like, how can I come and supersede that relationship and get a good deal or a better deal than her? Like, that just makes absolutely no sense. Like, even I, you know, I really did believe that. But it's just through my own experiences of acquiring and accruing a por- property portfolio. And then when I was audacious enough to try to help others do it um, in a DIY fashion, when I saw that, you know, like, let, let's just uh, pick on a random example, like off-market deals. Now, we all know that most off-market deals are, are, are rubbish. They're off-market for a reason or whatever the case may be. But let's say there is genuinely good off-market deal. Now, just my own experience has suggested that I, I won't say just my clients because anyone can do this, whether you, you do the course or not. But just being a nice human being, like being polite, being courteous, being professional, being efficient with the agent, coming across as someone who knows what they're doing and is ready to get their deal done. If you just build a relationship with an agent over the course of two, three, four, five, six weeks, then they are going to give you off-market deals if they actually like you. Like, you know, there's a there's a location right now. um, I. I'm happy to share it. Like, I actually don't know how to pronounce it properly. It's in regional um, South Australia, Nuriotpa. Forgive me if I can't pronounce it properly. There's, there's the key agent there, the key sales agent there. He's not even giving any deals to anyone except this one buyer's agent that's completely bought him out, right? So it's like, you can't even get it. He, there's just no point talking to him. He's just sending every single deal he gets before it lists to that buyer's agent, all right? And so one of my... I, I don't, one second, I don't want to come across salesy, so I'll just say, not client, but one person I know. Um, he was just saying, look, you know, I, I really want to buy in this location. This is the reason, like, I'm a property investor. This is going to be just my second property. My budget is, you know, X to Y ish. And this is what I'm looking for. The sales agent just flatly said, like, mate, we have a relationship with the buyer's agent. We're just not going to, we're not going to entertain you. And my, my client or the, this person was just being very open and honest, like, like I really want to buy property. Like you in the small location, you literally sell more than forty percent of properties. Like, please just let me know if you can. I'll, I'll take it off you. And the agent did. Like you know, one day he got a call and and he got this off market deal. And I'm not saying it was like a perfect deal and it's going to make you know hundred thousand dollars in the first month or anything like that. But that happened. And so the reason I'm so passionate about it is that I understand that opposing opinion. Like it sounds very credible. But just through my own experiences, not a sample size of one or 10 or 100, but thousands, I've seen the opposite happen. And so that's why I'm just trying to level the playing field, so to speak. So a couple of things. Let's, let's just get it very, very clear that I'm not of the school that thinks that every, every Australian is going to ultimately use a buyer's agent. Um, I think that's a myth that's perpetuated by people trying to um, sell various services, courses, whatever they're selling. Uh, and the fact is it's based on what the American experience and the American experience is um, fundamentally different to the Australian experience in that the seller pays for all all brokers, both buyers and sellers. And in Australia, we don't have that. We have a user pay. So because it's a user pay system, um, if you compare, say, buyers agents to mortgage brokers, you know, both, both very focused on their clients, uh, clients don't pay mortgage brokers, the banks do. And so you've got uptakers at 75% of people now using brokers, Chris. Thereabouts, it's been rising rapidly. You know, it, it you, soon it'll be a hundred, right? <laughs> However, with buyers agents, nobody actually knows how many buyers agents are in Australia. At best estimates, are it's between eighteen hundred and two thousand. There's something like seventy thousand sales agents in Australia. Not all of those actually act 
as sales agents, the best estimate there, because some people are accountants and some brokers, for argument's sake, have real estate licenses. So the best estimate there, there's something like 50 to 60,000 sales agents across the country. No buyer's agent can stitch up relationships with every single one of those 50 or 60,000 sales agents. So even though Chris sort of started that line of questioning, because a local specialist will have those really strong established relationships and all the rest of it, at the end of the day, that, that is one tiny value out of an experienced local specialist buyer's agent, but it is, it is by far, um, far and away, not even the most, uh, you know, the biggest value add. And a lot of inexperienced buyers agents do bang on about the off-market, the access to off-markets, because it's a really easy and lazy sales pitch, quite frankly, because that's where a lot of buyers who struggle to find a property think that's the silver bullet, that's the holy grail, that's where I'm missing out, I'm not getting access to this hidden market. And that's a really obvious sales pitch for people who want to give people what they want to hear without necessarily bringing in a whole um, deal of value. So therefore, the off-market thing, as you say, you've commented, most of it's rubbish, most of it's overpriced, quite frankly. But also these tiny, these tidy little relationships that you've alluded to with New Europe to that, down there in South Australia, for argument's sake, I've heard similar stories time and time again. A lot of regional agents in particular with their fly-in, fly-out buyers agents, some of them don't even fly in, they buy it all remote, remotely. They stitch a deal up and they sell all their shit to that buyers agent's clients and so it's an easy sale for them. It's money for jam. Like, why do they have? They don't have to work too hard. So I worry actually about your guy. There's like a scarcity that's been created for your student that's who's felt like he's been locked out of something and desperately wanted something. Possibly he bought something that, that buyer's agent wouldn't even touch. So I mean that that that's just my contrarian way of looking at that story. There's lots of different ways to to look at it, but certainly I've heard story after story, and I've had agents tell me. Uh, regional agents tell me stories about the deals that they do and the and the the volume of deals that they do through certain buyers agents who have used data to get them to a location, but the data gets them to the the, the location, but it doesn't help them actually asset you know select the correct asset. And so you know this this sort of problems with with just looking at, at agent relationships as being the one benefit that um, buyers agent can bring to the table. Do you know? One of the things, though, that PKU talk about is you're saying that the combination of a property manager, um, data, and a building pest inspector basically covers everything that a buyer's agent would do. And therefore, from your own living room or your own desk, you can buy property anywhere in Australia. But are you not concerned that there might be some gaping holes in in that process? Um, So the the process that I personally uh, followed to to build my portfolio, and I'm not saying mine's the best portfolio in Australia or anything like that at all. Um, and then that I teach is basically we start with strategy. And now, of course, strategy means different things to different people, but I genuinely think that strategy, portfolio strategy means, all right, to achieve some goal in the future, you know, how do we reverse engineer it? How many properties do we need? How, what's the frequency of that, of those purchases? What's the kind of yield that we need? What's the timing, you know, how do we create a lending strategy? Because it's, it's so easy to say, yeah, let's get 10 properties in 10 years. But look, we all know that those days are long gone. It's not that easy anymore, especially if you're buying poorly yielding properties from a cash flow and borrowing capacity perspective. So that that's sort of the first thing. And I think to, to achieve like a cohesive, robust, realistic, long-term strategy, that is really the, the foray of a good mortgage broker and accountant combined. And I think most buyers agents, I'll just go step by step, most buyers agents don't entertain that because they're not paid to, to, to get any outcome in that area. That's where the accountant and mortgage broker works with the client or, or the property investor. Um, so that, that's sort of the first step. And then the f- second step is, okay, how do we translate that long-term portfolio strategy into a realistic short-term strategy, i.e., What's the next property purchase? What's the yield that we need that is congruent with our household budget and future ability to purchase properties? What's the kind of active versus passive standpoint? You know, are we wanting to renovate? Are we wanting to develop, subdivide, rezone, et cetera, or just set and forget, buy and hold, very passive? You know, what's the kind of risk appetite? Are you, you know, willing to buy in a mining town? Like I'm against mining towns from a long-term perspective, but 
you know, there's plenty of people that have made a lot of money in mining towns, not my risk appetite, but so you know, there's, there's conversations like that to be had and, and a few other things. So you then boil it down to, you know, your, your next purchase. And then it comes to suburb selection. Now, in my mind, nothing can beat proper suburb selection beyond data. Now, when we use words like data, like kind of flippantly, I think some people, I'm not saying you, um, kind of think, oh yeah, let's just use a random score off the internet or, you know, four or five metrics and push them together and let's, let's buy in a suburb. But I think people, hopefully through podcasts like yourselves, are actually like more educated than that now, even without doing any random course. They actually know that true data means both macroeconomic data and microeconomic data. And so through the combination, you can really stress test, is this location going to do well in the short term? But also, is it going to do well in the long term? And it's very interesting, like when you run studies over 30, 40 years, you find that over the 30-year period, basically everywhere in Australia performs the same. And now when I say this, I'm, I'm using it generally speaking, if you do a normal distribution curve, more than 90% of locations are like basically performing at that 5 to 10%, or you could even boil it down to 7 to 9% um, annual growth rate mark. And then the balance of suburbs are kind of, you know, a little bit less in standard deviation, a little bit higher. So over the long term, 30 year period, like, it's not something that a property professional should say, but almost everywhere performs the same. So then you could argue you don't have to worry about selection. It doesn't matter where you buy almost, as long as you're not at the margins, you know, you're good. You're good. You can buy anywhere. Throw a dart at the map. Just yeah, buy I mean, th that's not my argument, but that's certainly a argument that someone could have over the long term, right? But as we all know, like, you know, to really get ahead through property, you, no one wants to be waiting um, like 30 years for growth and you're only going to be stuck with one or two properties if that is the case. You really need short-term growth. So when you run that analysis on a 15-year period, you find that the variance increases. You run it on a five-year period, the variance increases. Two-year period, the variance increases. So like property economics then from a data perspective, and once again, I'm just heavily relying on the data. You guys are probably much, much more experienced than me just by virtue of, you know, years in the game. But just from a data perspective, which you can then understand what's happened 20, 30, 40 years ago, even before I was born, you know, the reality is that property is all about short-term growth. We want that long-term growth. Don't get me wrong. We're not just buying in some dodgy area where it's, you're not going to have long-term growth. 30-year growth is almost guaranteed, but we do want 10 to 20-year growth. But the name of the game is short-term growth. And so if you can't extract equity or if you don't achieve meaningful growth in the first one to three years, I almost argue that the traditional strategy of acquisition, consolidation, and selling half to pay off the other half, it just doesn't work, right? So that, that's kind of my school of thought um, before I go on. Yeah, go on, Chris. So the, the short-term growth, um, at what in terms of, let's say, and when you get this short-term growth, what happens in the medium term? Let's say this asset does perform well in the short term. Technically, then you're best to recycle, right? Because if you've made your growth, you're best to sell, take your profits and go buy something else. Is that your strategy? Because it's going to revert to the mean. So you're well, going to have exactly. to. Exactly. So you've made, your, <laughs> you've made your money. Let's say, for example, people would have said um, Hobart, for example, is short-term growth prospects. Technically, the best place way to play a hotspot like that is to buy before it's a hotspot, right? Buy when, and that's, so you've got to have data or an insight that generally not what other people are thinking because otherwise that's factored into its price. So that's usually information. So you're, and, and that, that information may be wrong because the market doesn't believe what you're thinking. So you can potentially say, I'm going to go and buy in this regional town because I think there's going to be a hospital or it's going to be a train line or something. That does happen. And then you may get this real uplift, right? Um, but then ultimately in those markets, you want to leave before the party leaves, right? And so you, you, you buy in early and that would be, there's a chance of not getting that right because you could get a macro story change, you know, interest rates could go up or there could be a recession or something, right? Um, you pay stamp duty, then you make some money then you pay selling costs, then you pay capital gains tax. Plus maybe there's some sunk costs as well, but then you've got to then go replicate that and then, and, and, and do that again. Is that sort of your strategy, right? Is to, to buy, sell, flip. No, I think selling costs and transaction costs in Australia in general make it very cross prohibitive for that sort of um, very, very active flipping strategy to predictably work. Um, our, or at least my own strategy, has been really to not sell at all unless it is to retire debt. 
So what we're trying to achieve is we want the short-term growth. Like I said, the litmus test of any good property um, investment is that if you're actually being able to extract equity in a meaningful manner in the first one, two, three years, and then you want that medium and long-term growth as, as well. You don't just want, remember, it doesn't revert to the mean in 10 years' time. It reverts to the mean in that 20 to 30-year time. Okay, so let's, let's take an example. Let's take something from my own portfolio. So I bought an East Gosford. That was my first property in 2011. It's all I could afford, about 300K. Um, it was about neutrally geared, but of course, rates are a little bit higher than what they are now. Um, that did, I, it was kind of like average performance in the first year, like it went up by maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. But then the subsequent two years, it did really, really well. And it, I think, I can't remember. It was enough for me to extract equity twice. And then I think for the subsequent four years, it was kind of, neither here nor there, but it had allowed me to extract equity and the rents were going up. And so it wasn't costing me anything to hold. Because of that property, I was able to buy another couple of properties, traditional story, like no, nothing, no secrets in this. And then, you know, since that time, it's doubled again. So it's, I think it's had like two um, growth spurts or like it's, it's gone up to uh, what's probably like eight, $900,000 now or something. So I'm not saying, and I'm not trying to pick like some cherry picked example, but I'm not saying that we, I should have sold that property after the first two or three years of growth. No, we want to keep it because ultimately everyone has a different strategy, but at least the people who work with me and what I do, I want passive income, right? I have passive income. If I was constantly chasing growth, 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 then that would have been really hard because it's really hard to pick the bottom and top of the market every single time perfectly. But ultimately, this is the cash cow. It's like the golden goose. So you don't want to sell something that's giving you the golden eggs. And just to pick up on one thing as well, you know, like train lines, a new train line even has no real correlation with capital growth or hospital. Hospital has more of a correlation, but not really universities or anything like that. That's all, I'll leave hotspot picking based on infrastructure to someone who can do it much better than I can, but we use different metrics. I'm happy to share them as well. So um, with your strategy, for example, I know that you said, um, you know, when you're basing the property purchase, you really important to know exactly what yield you can get, right? Um, and because of your cash flow, you said, in terms of affording it, or maybe because of your future borrowing capacity, et cetera. But yield makes a, rent makes a really minor impact to borrowing capacity, like ridiculously small. Whether a property has a 4% yield or a 3% yield, that difference in terms of how much you can borrow is really minor, right? So buying high yielding properties for, few, for more borrowing capacity in the future is a bit of a myth because you're not going to get much more, right? Um, so do you, do you believe that, you know, let's say you had a budget of a million dollars, you should buy three properties at three, 400 or one property a million. Like, is it everyone, no matter what their budget is, they should buy a quantity because it's higher yield versus, you know, maybe one property. So I think uh, quantity and quality don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I think not that you're alluding to this, but I think that can be a misnomer amongst some people that somehow a 300k, 400k, 500k, 600k property is, is somehow an inferior asset in terms of its ability to give cash flow and growth than a million, two million, three million dollar Sydney blue chip stunner or Mel Melbourne blue chip stunner, so to speak. In terms of your um, sort of point there around yield has no impact on borrowing capacity, I, I do agree. Going from 3% to 4% isn't going to mean uh, the world of difference, but going from a 3%, $1.5, 1 million Melbourne, Sydney property to a, a 6%, 7%, you know, like sub $600,000 property that jumped from 3% yield to 6 or 7%. Of course, it's not, you know, going to allow you to improve your borrowing capacity. That's another myth that some people have that as long as you buy high yield, you can buy unlimited properties, but it, that does have an impact on borrowing capacity. But I think more so, and I can speak from my experience, it's your household budget and the cash flows that, that really allow you to say, okay, well, should I buy that $1 million property in Sydney? A, I can't afford it. I couldn't afford it back then. Um, B, it would have cost me I'm just making up a number, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year to hold it. It's green leafy street, looks amazing, has all the emotive aspects of it where you'd think it's a great asset. But 
really, I just, if that was it, I wouldn't be able to buy any more properties because it would just suck my bank dry in terms of cash flows. Maybe that's a, a strategy for someone who is more of a high net worth individual. But then there's, yeah, we can go into that as well and discuss different approaches. So do you, do you think like that though? Do you think that someone, um, cause one of the frustrations I've seen in the broken world, right. Um, is we'll see clients who are on the high income spectrum, right. And typically our clients are right. Um, and they've gone to buyers agents and they've just gone, well, our cookie cutter approach is buying quantity, right. And all of a sudden they've butchered them, right? So they've got four or five properties that are, you know, all over the place and, um, you know, and they're, they're basically where they've just gone to buy, right? So they might be buying in Logan or they might be buying in Adelaide or Perth, et cetera, right? Um, and, you know, if you look back on it, they could potentially have got into the quality assets. And I, I would we could definitely talk about this, what drives prices is scarcity and income growth and asset growth, right? Um, and the, the income growth doesn't drive prices that we've done some studies on that, by the way, um, traditional income growth as in wage growth, even absolute wages, if you regress that against capital growth, it has, the R squared is kind of unmeaningful. So you'd say that the, the, uh, suburbs that have got higher incomes growing in that suburb can't borrow more money. And so ultimately they can't, if they can borrow more money, they're not going to go spend that on property. I mean, the rationale sounds legit and this rationale sounds solid. But as someone who's like into data, it's sometimes hard to rationalize why something is the way it is. But just looking at the cold, hard data, I can share it afterwards as well. Let's, well, that's um, what gentrification it, is. So for example, let's say um, a suburb is next to a bridesmaid suburb, right? Let's say all the, the people in that city that are earning incomes that are higher want to live in this certain part of the city, right? So let's say I'll pick Newcastle, for example. Um, everyone wants to live in Merriweather, right? And everyone who's earning two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars because they can afford to, they'll live in Merriweather, right? Ultimately, we're a lifestyle in terms of um, when you're earning income, you're aspirational, you want to live in great areas, you want to provide great things for your kids. Once they can't afford Merriweather, what do they do? They move to the next suburb, so they move to Adamstown, right? So what's happened is the income growth in Adamstown has now increased because that high income person wasn't in Adamstown before. So now they've moved to Adamstown. So income growth in Adamstown is going up. So is property prices because they can't. And, and that's ultimately what happens. So income growth, it doesn't, it, it get it sort of gentrify, gentrifies and it's a ripple effect. So yeah. So that ripple effect is very real. But that's driven by income growth. That's driven by income growth, but not in the same suburb. So like what you can also, I'll give you, and this is the problem when we talk about individual examples, because I can come up with hundreds and you can come up with hundreds and we can respectfully agree to disagree. But like, I'll give you another example, like Morfitt Vale in the south part of Adelaide, like not the best like location in terms of socio-demographic status and incomes aren't very high and they haven't really been rising. I mean, Adelaide is, as an economy has been doing much better in the last few years, but before that it was kind of in the doldrums for a long time right? Um, in 2019, I think we started investing in places like Morfitt Vale for around 300k. And I'm not saying like everywhere, Morfitt Vale is a big suburb, there's good pockets, there's bad pockets, like in any place. And like that's literally doubled. Um, and I, I can't tell you that incomes have increased in any meaningful way. So Right. I'm going to give you something. I had a very good conversation with Kent Lardner about this a while back, actually. And Kent's got an interesting metric, which is um, average, I'm not going to try to remember exactly what it is, but it's basically the median for, for, I think he does for SA3s for a median price, um, as a ratio to incomes, right? So if it's too high, it's a problem, right? And there's also, it depends who's buying in that area. If it's a bunch of investors who are buying in that area that do not live in that area, then the incomes that you're talking about are the incomes of the people buying there are not from the residents in that area, which is actually a problem. And so as a, as a, one of the, the metrics that you need to be looking for when you're looking at investing is not somewhere where locals can't afford to buy property. And the only people that are pushing the prices up are investors that don't even live there. You need to be looking at an area that's aspirational so that locals can afford to buy and will buy there. Yeah, I, I genuinely thought as well that, I mean, I could still be wrong. I'm just saying what I'm seeing in the data. I'm up on the Northern Beaches, right? So what's driving prices the last few years? It's income growth. So it's buying capacity plus income growth because the locals can't afford it. So what's pushing prices up 
is new incomes. So that it's it's people who have moving from the eastern suburbs are earning four, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars. And the whole suburb, the incomes aren't going much because only five percent of properties are transacting. And so only five percent of the incomes are increasing. So over a je- over a decade, income growth is actually what drives prices. I think you're I think you're right. Um I think it could be because I have different experiences so i think there could be more nuance as well like you, that you're probably aware of like in some areas like low and north shore you're probably like bang on um but in other areas it's more about the latency of affordability so even though the incomes aren't going up there's so much buffer in the affordability that then when prices do start to go up people have the ability to pay more and more despite incomes not increasing like i can like where i'm living right now in bundle i can tell you like incomes haven't been rising because most people who live here are like very elderly um, but you've moved but, there, right? So you've moved but to I've Bundle. Moved there, but I don't and, see anyone else having moved there. Like there's not that many young families or anything like that. And this is just anecdotal. So, you know, treat, treat it with a grain of salt. Um, but income like this place has gone up like 50% in the last few years. So, I mean, how much of it is a COVID effect versus, you know, well, it's hard to strip out in perfectly, but I can tell you incomes have not increased in this suburb. So, so that's why I'm kind of my maybe hypothesis based on what you're saying as well is that the the dynamic of income growth may be supplemented with latency of of borrowing power or you know how much buffer there is in affordability as well in some areas where you know it's really pushing up against that affordability story you need more incomes to rise prices in other areas where people have so much affordability you know they they do up their homes and that increases the value of the suburb it, it's it's hard to kind of generalize so the way to in- to measure income growth is in the property market isn't at a suburb level because you've got 30% of the buyers are old. You know, they're not working, for example. They might be retirees. They might be 30, 40% of, you know, boarding that suburb 20 years ago, right? So suburb level income level doesn't really matter. What income level that you need to test is the current buyers in the market. What are they earning today versus what were they earning five, 10 years ago, right? And that's what a suburb gentrifies, right? So at some point, um, it was, you know, uh, two medium incomes were buying in that suburb. Now it's two higher incomes, right? Um, and so absolutely, if you look at any, any city, for example, let's say it was Adelaide, um, I would say that the growth would be better in the parts of Adelaide over the longer term where income growth is significant, right? Um, because that means their borrowing capacities are going up. That means they're more likely to have other wealth in other assets to be reinvesting into that, for that suburb. So Income growth at a suburb level is really hard because it's diluted by people who aren't working, the people who are, who are bought in the suburbs a long time ago. I'm on a personal mission to help more people make better property decisions. And you can find out all about what I'm working on at veronicamorgan.com.au. And there you'll find resources for first home buyers, details about my buyer's agent mentoring program, access to suburb help for investors, or if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or lower north shore, you can connect with my team at Good Deeds Property Buyers. If you're thinking about buying your first home, upgrading to a new one, or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, we would love to carefully guide you through this journey and importantly get the finance right. Please reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Don't forget that you can download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. No, I agree. And 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 actually it's it's funny we're talking about this. It's actually a factor, like a long term factor that I actually teach my students, but hand on heart, I can't say that if incomes go up, that property prices go up. And so it is something that um you have as a um a fail safe, you know, another check and balance in terms of location selection, but it's it's not. There's no coral. There's no one to one correlation there that that I can see at least. I mean, we don't have to go on this point for. But for example, what COVID was um, did is showed us how cities, in particular regions, will change in property price when their buyers change. Right. So the buyers in in south coast of Sydney, of central coast, where you're Gosford. This is what Gosford's benefited from. Um, and I would say the Gosford didn't benefit anywhere near as much as Avoca did or Wombrel did, um, et cetera, where the high income buyers really wanted to be. So your performance on East Gosford would have been nowhere near as performance of those properties. Um, but what happened is the incomes changed. So those areas changed, the buyers changed. So what caused the prices of the properties to go up? The incomes changed. Um, and so I, I would say that one of the strongest 
determinants of capital growth long term would have to be the income growth. Um, and I'd be I can share to with you a chart later on to literally those two lines on the chart and there's no correlation. I'm not saying what you're saying is incorrect. I'm just saying that it can't be extrapolated to ha- to be a one-to-one relationship because once again, there's so many examples. Like we don't, we've not really invested in Logan. Like, you know, let's pick Logan because it's a favorite. Um, I've sort of been anti-Logan because a lot of the recent price movement has been so many buyers agents, so many interstate investors from down south, Sydney, Melbourne, et cetera, just like, you know, it's like a flock of, um, you know, everyone's, you know, kind of go on there and, and push property prices up. Um, have they come down? Not so, I'm not sticking up for Logan. Like I have no vested interest in Logan. We've not really invested in Logan. But property prices haven't come down. In fact, now they're starting to edge up again. Um, I'm not, I'm, this is not me saying you should invest in Logan or anything like that, but Logan's look, Logan's probably a good example of of a lot of things. It's a good example of the three of us agreeing on something. It's also a good example of where a lot of hype and a lot of bullshit has led a lot of people to invest somewhere and local Brisbane based buyers agents, uh, Generally, I would say the majority of them don't buy in Logan either, right? So it's a province of those fly in, fly out buyers agents who follow a bit of a trend, right? So whatever trend led people, probably led by the growth corridor, you know, um, spruker publicity, blah, 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 whatever. Logan for a long time, and yes, maybe recently they've had a little bit of price growth and whatever, so has the entire country in 2021. Um, but Logan went for a good decade doing bugger all in terms of prices, right? So that's sort of got nothing to do with income. Let's move this conversation away from income. That's got to do with overdevelopment. That's got to do with um, with a lack of scarcity and, and a lot of supply. And let's, let's not, maybe it's not overdevelopment, I don't know, but a lot of development, a lot of stock, a lot of homogenous stock and um, – you know, also, you know, in some parts of it, low socioeconomics as well. You know, so there's a lot of factors that combine and all that wishful thinking from Southern dollars that over, probably overvalued a lot of these properties because they're thinking with Sydney and Melbourne prices, this looks like great value. How can we possibly go wrong? There's a lot of fallacies that are entertained in people in both professionals, uh, loosely, I've got rabbit ears around that, but loosely using the word professionals in the property space, but also a lot of investors. A lot of people say that Australian investors aren't aren't that naive, aren't that silly. But I would hazard that no, most are that naive and that silly. And even you know, you earlier you said someone was a really good buyers agent. Well, to be quite honest, I'm not sure you would know how to judge a really good buyers agent. Like most people don't know how to judge a really good buyers agent because most people have never met one. Most people actually don't know the insights that a true expert can bring to the table. But all Australians seem to think that we're property experts because we live in one. And so, therefore, we know everything there is to buy, you know know about buying one. So there's a, there's a lot of a lot of us have fallacies around what we believe to be true around property. And there's also these sort of behavioural biases that we have as well. That when we make big decisions, big important decisions, we we then like to um, verify our own decisions because uh, you know to basically then challenge ourselves would be actually very uncomfortable and we don't like to do that. So then we encourage our friends and family to do the same things that we just did as well. So what's sort of under underlying the behavior around a lot of property investors and probably what fed a lot of the demand around Logan is that type of behavior. You know, we, we're, we're a flock of sheep, right? And so when we come to um, to buying property and really the nuance that someone who's really experienced can bring to the table is to it's pattern interrupt a lot of that stuff. You know, it's like actually a really good buyer's agent is not an order taker. It doesn't just go, oh, yeah, I'll go and find you something in southeast Queensland because I read somewhere that's that's the next place to take off. A real buyer's agent goes to the what you were talking about earlier about strategy and actually saying, have you got a good broker on board to give you a, you know, a borrowing strategy. Have you got an accountant on board? Have you looked at structuring? Have you looked at, you know, how many does it take? How many properties at what year? Blah blah blah. All of these things. Um, what needs to be put put in place for your long term plans to come to fruition? But the other thing too, you talk about, you know, the bell curve of basically all Australian property prices, you know, over a thirty forty year period of time, and I think it's eight eight percent 
per annum growth the Australian property market has experienced over the last 100 years or something. You can't make individual decisions based on aggregate data. The problem is that if you look in one suburb, say you pick a beachside suburb and you've got a highway running up, um, up the coast of most beachside suburbs, one side of that beachside, sub, beachside suburb is going to be closer to the water than the other side. And there is a decoupling that ex- is experienced in locations like that and, and the equivalent of that across the country where not everything performs really well. You know, and yes, you can say one side's more expensive than the other. But then when you start to see a difference in performance over time, that's where the decoupling happens. Some properties, and that yet you chuck all that data in the same bucket and it's all aggregated and some, you know, it's going to dilute a lot of the individual nuance that actually allows people to make good decisions. And so when you said we can bring out these nuanced ex- examples, that's actually what counts when making individual decisions. Because you're never buying a piece of a market, you're buying one individual property. You're throwing all of your, all of your eggs, all of your hope and all of your, your thesis that that is the one. In this current market, whatever money I've got available to me, I'm making one decision based on all the information that I can get my hands on. I'm, my bet is that that's the best possible property I can buy for my money. And so that's the problem with relying on data or trying to say that incomes don't, you know, correlate because that's aggregate data. We need to understand really what drives an individual market and that changes over time. So I, back to the original question, which sort of got, we got a bit way laid off, um, you know, your, your due diligence process, and you've been quite vocal about this, you know, a property manager can inspect a property and advise you whether or not you should buy it, whether or not it's a good investment. And I ask you again, are you not concerned that there are gaping holes in that as an assumption? Yeah, no, it's a, a great question. And, and maybe I'll, I'll just sort of um, elaborate a couple of things you just said to kind of um, make the point as well. Uh, there's obviously aggregate data and you have to take it for what it's worth. Like interest rates are apparently meant to reduce retail spending. You know, have they done it? Who knows, right? Um, but then we make some inferences and then bring that down, of course, as you know, to the SA3 level, local government area level, down, down, down. So data is not just, um, you know, at the at the aggregate level. It can be very useful. In fact, it's more useful when you go into those nuances. And I think it's sort of incumbent on us and myself, loosely air quotations, property professionals, to to really challenge ourselves and challenge the data as well, as well as our experiences and, and anecdotes because um and I'll come to the PM property manager question in a second. Like let's say Logan, like I got that. I will say that none of my clients were bought in places like Logan Central, like in Woodridge and all this stuff. However, they have gone up far more in property price, just medians and take medians with a grain of salt, like you said, than basically most parts of more premium Brisbane. Now I own multiple properties in more premium Brisbane, and they haven't done as well as these, um, you know, these these properties and suburbs in in parts of like lower socioeconomic Logan. So I have to ask myself as a property professional, like, why did I not pick it? Like, what did I get wrong? Or am I right? And those areas are now going to fall because the fundamentals never stuck up because the local population doesn't want to live there because the local incomes don't rise. Because this whole FOMO that was created on the east, uh, on the southern states, investors buying in Logan, that was there in 2013. That was there like in record levels in 2013, 14, 15. I remember being a more of a novice property investor, and I was like, "Yeah, we should buy in Logan." Because every there was there was a huge sort of um, fanfare going on, but property prices didn't really do anything back then. So there has to be more to it. And and uh, the whole, only point I'm trying to make here is that we should always question ourselves as well, um, because I certainly did not expect Logan to go up that much. Um, in terms of property management and the use of property managers and the whole process, so once you've got the suburb selected or suburbs, you could say pocket, you know, it's not an artificial boundary around a suburb, um, then there's various other things to, to look at. And it's not that we just go in and say, you know, let's just try to buy, and buy the average property. Of course, as you know, there's housing commission, of course, if you run the numbers at a disaggregated level, you find that housing commission doesn't really impact property prices as much as even I would intuitively think it does. But, you know, we try to stay clear of things like 
you know, where the zoning is inappropriate, where there's flood zones, bush, bushfire zones, soil quality, flight zones, even things like the quality of the neighbors, the, the dwelling height, the age, parks, primary schools, shape of land, dwelling orientation, you know, just like there's a whole list of things that I'm sure everyone should be looking at. And then once you've actually selected the right pocket, based on both quantitative and qualitative data, much of what I've just said is, is qualitative, then, you know, let's say you don't want to, to visit and I can hand on heart say I've never visited any of my 12 properties, <laughs> including my principal place of residence before I bought it. Um, and so how do you do that? It's through a two-step process. And let's d discuss and debate where the holes are in this um, of a property manager and building and pest inspector. Now, property managers, like in any professional, there's good people, there's bad people, people in the middle. There's a no offense, and I'm not trying to be like sexist or anything, but you know, this is a 22-year-old lady that doesn't know anything about property and doesn't have any property or male for that matter. You know, you don't want to maybe get advice from that person. Rather, maybe the 35 or 40, 50-year-old property manager who's been doing it for 10 years knows that suburb inside out. It's that kind of person that we, I, lean on to say, okay, what kind of tenant appeal does this property have? What kind of future owner-occupier appeal does this property have? Does, just because it doesn't have this green leafy streets, just because it's not a property that I would like to live in, doesn't mean that the local demographic doesn't demand it now and in the future. And of course, they go in and they do this you know, 50-point checklist of various things that do. You can't just outsource that and expect them to do a good job. You need to manage them. Like I said, you have to learn how to do this. And if you don't want to learn, then that's where a buyer's agent can do it themselves. Are you paying the property manager? No. And, and this, is the, this is the thing. And people often ask, well, including clients, hey, PK, how can, we, how can we trust a property manager to give us such vital information? We're spending 400, 500, 600, 700 K. How can we trust them with such an important decision when we're not even paying them, when we don't even have an, any agreement with them? And in the way that I've experienced it, and I just teach based on experiences, A, you have to find someone with those three Cs, care, competency, and character, like that is an essential thing. And then, of course, there's this old adage that the only professional that cares about, is, about your property as much as you do is the one that's associated with it for the longest period of time. And a mortgage broker is essential, right? Conveyancer is essential, Buyer's agent, I won't say anything, but a property manager is with your property for the longest period of time, basically the entire tenure of your ownership. And so they may lie just to get that property management um, you know, book. They, they may lie just to, to get your business, but that lie is going to surface. It's going to um, rear its ugly head at some point, and then you know, that's not going to be a pretty conversation. Also, I think people need to realize that property managers, they don't want to manage high maintenance, bad, ugly duckling properties. They want easy business. And I mean, we can go into the pros and cons, everything has pros and cons. And then with a building and pest inspector to really make sure that more structural um, solidarity is, is existing there in the house, that sort of two-step process um, basically does the job. So my, I, I, with, with property managers, I guess it's, I personally think it's, it's quite dangerous. The reason I would say that is Property managers are thinking about what's good to rent, right? What can I easily rent? Um, and what do I usually rent, right? What have I got experience in? But the property market is driven by not what people want to rent and not what people want to pay for rent. It's what people want to buy and what people are willing to stretch for and what people are willing to pay more money for, right? Um, because the price of a property is not on how much you can get for rent. How much are people willing to, to purchase it for, right? And so what really matters is, is who really wants to buy it? What are they earning? How much? How much do the locals want to be in that part of the suburb, right? And what you'll find in the best suburbs, there's very little rental properties because they're highly driven by owner occupiers. So a property manager could be 10 years experience in a suburb, but have not rented any properties or very few properties in the best sub streets in that suburb. All they've gone and rented is apartments and townhouses and units and things on the busy roads, things that have investors have bought. So what you're doing is you're getting advice from someone who's got a I would say, um, dysfunctional view on the market because they're not sales agents. They don't know what people go crazy for at auctions. They don't know what people get, um, you know, the bit locals really want to upgrade into. And that's what drives prices is the buying market, not the rental market. 
you could definitely get a property manager to say, yeah, that property is going to be easy to rent because it's a little unit or it's a little townhouse that's presentable and we've got very low vacancy rates, but any property that's a good asset is easy to rent. So I think you, I, I don't know, I think you're getting, you're getting insights into the market that aren't the right insights. What you actually want is the sales agent's insights in the area that where can you not get a property in this suburb? What is that? Where do people never sell? And they'll say, well, to be honest, everyone wants to be on these three streets because you know what? It's the local, it's the access to amenity. It's access to school. It's the aspect, the views, the, the block sizes, the people within that suburb never sell. It's tightly held. That's the information you want. There's no rat runs. There's no busy roads. There's no housing commission. There's no um, pri- like th- that's the insights. The pr- property manager doesn't have that information. So I think two things, those things that you just mentioned, like views and no busy roads and parks or et cetera, et cetera, all of that is already done even before you go to a property manager, like I mentioned, like all of that stuff, both quantitative and qualitative, can be ascertained, A, online, like everything is online these days, but sometimes you need to validate and add to your online research. And that's where some phone calls with real estate agents, exactly like you said, is very important, right? To validate, to sense check, to really make sure that you've got things right. Of course, real estate agents, like any professionals, quote unquote, need to be taken with a grain of salt. And so it's always good to validate maybe with two, three, four real estate agents. But once again, I'm not a property manager, but I feel the need to stick up for them because like, let's say you have a, like I I have this really wonderful property manager. Her name is Magella. Um, I have a property in Fernie Hills in, in Brisbane, which is a pretty nice suburb. I'm not sure if you'd classify as a as a nice suburb, but I reckon it's okay. Um, and like she's been with that company for 20 years. Like, you know, yes, she's a property manager, but I would argue that she's been around in that suburb for longer than any real estate agent and knows more than any real estate agent. And like I would recommend her to like my mom if she was investing in property because she knows those tightly held pockets. And so through our research, we can come to that conclusion. I can get on the phone with Magellan and be like, hey, have I got it right? Or is it, I know this is not a main road, but maybe this is one of those roads where people take like a shortcut to get to another main road. And then all of a sudden it becomes a main road, even though it's not. And so to validate those sorts of things, like she's invaluable. So I think you're right. There are some property managers, 80% of their book is units. Maybe the, the house, the freestanding dwelling advice, you know, is not that great from them, but there's always wonderful property managers as well. And within those, there's amazing ones that know more than agents. I think just getting as much information from different professionals um, and making up your own decision is a, is a really good thing to do. I think um, certainly we, were, we won't bag property um, managers. I mean, uh, that's an essential part of our due diligence process is to, uh, for invest when we're looking for investors, is to engage a local uh, property manager. We wouldn't be so, so arrogant to assume we know what makes a good rental, nor what exactly what the rental market is doing at the time. And so we want to get advice from them as to what's a reasonable rental es- estimate in the current market, what needs to be done to this property in terms of improve it to maximise that rent, all that sort of thing. Very different conversation to a sales agent if we were, if we were doing vendor adv- advocacy and we wanted to work through, well, what's, how, what's the best way to sell this property to maximise the sale price? They're different conversations. They sa- sound a little similar, but the, the actual output and the result of those conversations will always be different. I used to be a sales agent many, many years ago. And I often tell the story about, you know, it feels like when you're driving to an appraisal and you're driving down the street and you don't know which house it is and, and you're passing all the houses and you're looking for the number you're after. It's like the big wheel of fortune. Someone's spun it and you're hoping it doesn't hit bankrupt. It's jackpot, right? And, and you know, when you pull up outside some houses, you go, ah, oh, cracker, this one is going to fly. It's going to go off like a frog in a sock, which was our little saying in our office. And, and that's the sort of property, and I, I've actually since done quite a lot, lot of analysis on that type of property, and you can see that the capital growth on those crackers does outstrip other properties in the suburb. Um, time and time again, I've got countless case studies to, to demonstrate this, but the, the difference being um, property managers and salespeople do look for different features in properties. And generally speaking, as, as Chris said, a cracker that goes off, off like a frog in a sock in a sales sense, will typically rent well as well, but not necessarily the same in reverse. So, so there are some 
some problems um, with relying on a property manager to give you advice in terms of the asset caliber. And I actually, and I don't think I've ever told this story in this podcast before, but we, some years ago, I developed a, a portfolio um, review program where we could assess the caliber, asset caliber of properties anywhere in the country. So this was, uh, there was a lot of research went into this, a lot of the methodology goes into this. And it, the, fundamentally, we're trying to work out whether a, pl- a property is what we call a flyer, a floater, or a flop, right? So a flyer is just one of those cracker assets. You want to always own flyers. A floater, you d- if you already are, you try not to buy one, but if you already own it, you determine whether you keep it or not based on other situations, other circumstances. And the flop, you should always try to either not buy in the first place or get out of your portfolio because it's a, it's opportunity cost, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that we did do was enlist local property managers to go and assess the property for us when a client had come to us and want to assess it. And, you know, we were we were trying to get them to give us meaningful assessments on these properties and we'd research to get the best property manager in the area, the most experienced one, et cetera, et cetera. I can honestly tell you they did not know what we were talking about. They did not get it. They couldn't. I didn't meet one in this exercise as we were trying to roll this thing out that actually could understand what we meant. And I didn't use the term asset caliber because I realized that that's only a certain uh, small segment of the market is going to even understand that. So I, I see that, you know, there's gaping holes in terms of accountability. There's gaping holes in terms of uh, a lack of insurance and there's where's your protections. But there's also the fact is that they want the business. They don't have to lie to get that business particularly if they don't know the difference between a good asset and a poor asset. You know, if it's going to rent out well and they go, yeah, it's be pretty easy to rent out, you know, it should be fine. It, they're not going to be able to determine the difference between a flying asset and a floating asset, you know. So, so I think that's really where that nuance and that ability to really cut through and, and say, this is a cracker asset, you should, you should go for it as a, and it will rent well, as opposed to it'll rent well, so therefore it's a cracker asset. It, it, there's... It, it doesn't necessarily follow on. So I think that there's definite weaknesses there. And the other thing too is that if somebody is not experienced themselves as a property investor, they're unlikely to going to be able to choose the right type of property manager that necessarily they won't necessarily have that same ability to be able to understand the difference between someone who's really experienced or just a business development, you know, manager in a I do, in a, I do agree with that. No, I, I do agree with that. And, and I think that's kind of the underlying thesis or, or the principle that we're talking about, is, which is education. Of course, if you don't know anything about selecting a, even a buyer's agent, you'll choose a, maybe not the best one, bad property manager, bad mortgage broker, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about education. But I think, you know, like very, very respectfully, I'll also say like you've um, had your own life experiences based on this, um, uh, you know, what you're sharing in terms of those property managers. I've had my own life experiences as well. Like, you know, for example, one client bought in in the Gold Coast and the property, it's it's kind of like when you were saying that I was like, oh, this is completely opposite to my experience because the property manager literally said, look, our real estate, um, our sales arm tells us that this is the best pocket of the suburb. I don't know why they're they're selling this for this price, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, if you're actually talking to the real estate agents and then you're corroborating what they're saying with what the property manager is saying and getting a holistic view, like it's, it's very possible. But like I, I definitely understand because everyone has different experiences and we make conclusions based on those experiences, but it's not necessarily like I may be wrong based on my experiences and you might be right and also vice versa. So I think it behooves everyone to actually become educated in, in all of these subjects because yeah, what, what you're being fed by me or anyone else may not be true. PK, I mean, uh, before we sort of like wrap it up, you think sort of, maybe if you're willing to share just some, some sort of suburbs or some areas at different price points that you would encourage people to look at, I guess, right now. Um, and um, if you're willing to sort of, uh, I guess, take a devil's advocate view with us and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what we, we like about it and what we don't. Let's just, I mean, it'd be interesting to sort of. Yeah, I think a, like a really interesting one would be Maybe if we just rewind, because then we have a bit of benefit of hindsight. If we rewind, um, maybe like two years ago, let's talk about Rockingham. Uh, it's a very popular spot in the south side of Perth. And um, the Rockingham City Council, um, my clients who will watch this, and even on my Facebook group, you'll know that I've been very, very bullish on that area. Um, and we started investing in, in Rockingham, Warnborough, Cooling Up, 
Waikiki, um, all these types of areas. I would say around 2021 start. I mean, Adelaide was still incredibly booming at that time, but so the data started to shift towards some of these pockets in Perth. And since that time, I mean, some of these areas, of course, talking medians, there's always exceptions have gone up literally at 50, 60%, um, despite, and this is where the kind of um, traditional property investing parlance or or myths kind of would steer you away from this area. Rockingham has an unemployment rate of almost 9%, I think. I could be wrong. It's 8 or 9%, pretty high. Um, incomes haven't been terrific. It's uh, to some extent, in some pockets, it's largely a fly and fly out area. So you might think, oh, hey, that's a risk. You know, when the mining boom turns, what's going to happen? But we're actually finding that many of the areas that we're buying in traditionally was fly and fly out, but now is more like hospitality. It is not like necessarily professionals, like lawyers and doctors and accountants, but there's hospitality workers and tourist work, et cetera. It's, it's diversified away from just mining and it's really far from the city. So, you know, like, when the client comes to me, they're always like, oh, what's the closest I can get to a CVD in my budget? And like, I just don't subscribe to that because if once again, you look at the data, but at the national level and at a city level, regardless of which city you actually choose, proximity to CBD makes absolutely no difference to, to capital growth. And in fact, as we all know, the generally speaking, the more further you go out from a CBD, the higher yields there are. So in my mind, it's like, why buy quote unquote blue chip? and pay an arm and a leg to hold it every year when it's not going to perform any more than, than a further out suburb. I'm not talking any suburb, of course. So I'm just looking here, them. PK, like Rockingham, for example, looking at uh, domain, looking at growth in 2022 and 2023, it's gone up 17%. I don't know where you're getting, is it got up 60%, did you say? Those are just medians, Chris. If you, if you actually look at specific properties and specific areas, like for example, in Waikiki, there's like a, little, like a main road and on the left-hand side of that road is closer to the ocean. On the right-hand side is not closer to the ocean, of course. Um, those areas have, have gone up much more. Same with Dudley Park. Uh, Dudley Park is a really good example of, a, of an area where you've got these like waterfront, I wouldn't call them mansions, but like million-dollar-plus properties. And then maybe three, four kilometers to the right or to the east, you've got actually what's quite a lower socioeconomic area. So... I mean, I don't subscribe to kind of going by just suburb means or, or medians, as you, I know you don't either. But I mean, Perth and Subiaco, for example, went up 30% um, in 2021, uh, 2022. So and if you looked at Cottesloe or you looked at a lot of the public suburbs in inner city Brisbane, uh, Perth, they also went up by just as much, if not more. I don't know. I just, that, that's just looking at medians, let alone trying to pick the... <laughs> so, I mean, it's great if they've gone up just as more, but... Like I was just saying, the principle that I subscribe to, and this is not for like if you're a high net worth individual, you have 10 million in the bank, you know, there's no point buying 20 properties at 500K each. But if you can get a high cash flow and the same, if not more, capital growth in a, in a city location, then why not? Especially if you're an average, like I just deal with average people, you know, quote unquote, their, you know, household income is between 100 and 200K. If, a, they couldn't even afford that Subiaco one. Even if they could, it would cost them so much on an annual basis. We all know what property management fees are in Perth. You know, they just couldn't get to the second. Or th that's, that's the end of it for them. So like the ultimate way we judge growth is bank valuations. And that's just what I'm basing it on. Oh, you're basing it on bank valuations. For example, if a property has been bought by a client, let's say May 2021, it's May 2023 now. And a client emails me saying, hey, PK, we bought it back then. We just had a bank valuation for X. Like that is what I'm basing it on. Yeah. The problem, I guess, with that is that, you know, by saying that they can't afford it, I mean, you're saying that they, um, that it doesn't matter what the growth is in those suburbs because they can't afford it. But then on the other side of this thing, you're saying that the performance in Rockingham is just as good as these suburbs when it's not. And, and I, I guess income and yield and cash flow, it sounds great. But if they're even earning a hundred to two hundred thousand, right, as couples, they're paying thirty-five to forty percent tax, right? And so you get a little bit extra yield, but you lose thirty-five, forty percent of that in tax anyway. Um, so what are they getting? An extra few hundred, few thousand dollars in their pocket at the end of the year. It's not much money difference in the yield, right? So I think maybe that's a little bit simplified. Like simplified. Like for example, I just I just know based on what they're telling me. Like if they're buying in a let's say million dollar suburb. 
that's going to cost them maybe ten, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars a year to hold, if not more, as interest rates go up. But even today, you can buy something. Not that I recommend Waikiki and these places right now in this part of the cycle, but you can buy something even today with a six and a half percent yield, which isn't going to be positive cash flow. Don't get me wrong; isn't going to allow your borrowing capacity to go up. But it's going to mean that you're only paying maybe one thousand dollars out of pocket, and like that. Like I understand where you're coming from, but in terms of the average punter, like that is a big difference: twelve thousand out of pocket versus one thousand, with or without tax. Like we're ignoring tax for for this purpose. It's also the focus on what the risk really is, you know. So that's focusing on risk being being out of pocket, whereas the risk really is in the asset not performing. Um, I'm curious when you say that you've been quite bullish on Rockingham, and I know you've got a big audience, so like. Do you have any numbers on how many people that follow your 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 tips have actually been buying in that area? Uh, no, I, I have no way to tell really. Do you mean on YouTube or Facebook group? Either or. I mean, the, the fact is that when this has happened with some of the larger buyers agencies that, that are very data-driven and will choose an area and then go and buy a lot of properties in those areas, then the prices start rising because they're buying a lot of properties in those areas. They go back to their clients and say, look, Prices are rising is in this area because, you know, we predicted it because our data pointed us in that direction and they go, great, they've got all this social proof and they're really excited about going and buying in that area. Then they add to the price rises and then prices keep rising when actually a one data house could have been responsible for a bit of capital growth in a particular location. So I'm just wondering because I know you've got a big following. I know that a lot of people do do trust what you say and, and do like what you say and obviously what your, your messaging resonates with a lot of people. if that happens to be the case in in this instance. Potentially, uh, some of that capital growth could have been generated by uh, your following. Well, I mean, back in my investment banking days, that would be called front running, and it's it's actually an illegal practice in the stock market to kind of um, you know buy something there and then sort of pump and dump it. I'm not saying that that happens in in the real estate market, but I mean, I'm not talking about pumping and dumping. I'm talking about you formed a thesis, you know. And if another, enough people are convinced with your thesis and follow your lead, then that can actually be self-fulfilling. It's not really the same as front, what you say, front leading, front running. Um, because it's not like, you know, you're not tra- on, trading on a platform with, with you know, ASX, Britain, Day and You know, this, this is literally, there's no regulation around this stuff. That's, that's half the problem with property advice in this country. Uh, honestly, I think I'm, I'm just... I'm a small fish in a big pond. You know what I mean? Like there's however many, one, two million property investors. I don't know how many of them are active. 10, 11,000 properties in Australia. I don't know, 500 to maybe one, uh, yeah, I don't know how many get traded on a yearly basis. At any one time, I maybe have one to 200 active um, clients. Uh, You know, people like, that are much larger and much have more influence than me, perhaps like yourselves or like the Markle Yardneys of this world, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure they have much more of an impact on the market when they're constantly going on about their blue chip suburbs. But yeah, I'm, I'm honestly, I can't quantify Well, there's that. more competition in blue, chip, in blue chip suburbs, you know. Have you so, tried to buy in Rockingham right now? Well, that's what I mean. I'm actually looking up Rockingham to see how many properties have traded in the last sort of year it's or like, so? It's immense. We're not even buying. Like, it's immense competition. No. Mm. Yep. So, Pika, I think there's, um, there's lots for, for us to unpack here. I think the, you know, it, it's important to sort of digest what you basically said there as well. The typical um, person you're looking at is that one to 200 salary, right? Where buying capacity is tight and budgets are tight and equity is tight and cash flow is tight, right? And in that situation, they have to look in certain suburbs that tick all those boxes, right? That do provide a yield um, to give them the confidence to purchase, right? Um, I think the other side of the coin is if a client comes to you um, of that one two hundred and they have got a more of a flexible budget and they've got bigger borrowing capacities and they've got higher trajectory of income, et cetera, then I guess it's important to look at the whole market, right? And go, look, is fewer better than, than more? You know, do you still, do you think that's something they should do? Or do you think that it's still go down this this quantity strategy where it's, it's, it's literally chasing yield when they don't need yield. You know, if they're all on top tax rate um, and they're all paying 50% tax on yield, why are they that? And they can afford big cash flow losses. Why would they be too concerned? They really want growth. Um, and do you, do you take that strategy with them? I think there's a nuisance value 
So like A, there's no trade-off necessarily needing to be made between yield and and growth. Like that is one thing that needs to be understood. But let, let's just take me. Like I've got to where I am and I'm like forever grateful and counting my lucky stars through the strategy that I've just taught. And of course, business income makes a big difference and all these buyers agents with 20, 30, 40 million dollar portfolios saying that you oh, follow their strategy and you'll get it. Or course creators for that matter. Like honestly speaking, business income does like have a big impact on borrowing capacity, which we don't talk about. But let's just take me for now. Like I'm not buying three hundred thousand dollar properties in Waikiki, right? Like that doesn't make sense for me anymore. So I'm in completely on the same page as you. Like I'm in the market for a three to four million dollar commercial property. Like and so if someone's coming to me with that kind of appetite, I'm not telling them. Not that I tell people where to buy anywhere. I teach them, but. I'm not saying that you should buy a $400,000 property. It's horses for courses. And I think that's where a lot of the, perhaps the misalignment in principles or in tactics comes from, because perhaps like our audiences are different. Therefore, our biases are skewing in different directions. That I mean, the, the person who just bought one um, buyer's agent of the year in Australia, he seems to go against a lot of things that you're just mentioning, but he's one the i don't know who nominates people oh, i don't know how they always people be nominate award themselves winners. uh award winners a um whole other uh, topic we could we could do a whole podcast yeah, on so that like, it's it's who enters who's paid for the company that puts that puts their submission in i mean i've judged awards and i'm telling you right now i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't put any claim to anybody that win any good on them for a, a, a entering an award I mean, it seems to be like the newest people seems to seem to win all these awards. Of course, because it's part them, of the marketing but... strategy to to get known, get some. No one's proof. Never, no one's ever nominated me for vice agent of the year. Maybe I'm just bitter. I've never been nominated for it either. So you they'd be nominate happy to yourself. Know um, um, but PK, it's awesome to chat. Um, well, before we finish up, have you got a property dumbo for us? Like a, a story we could um, learn from? Yeah, it's actually just like my own, um, like really just stupid mistake. I bought that Fernie Hills property I was telling you about. It's like on a slope and the slope is away from the road down into the house. So it's like a very obvious one, but like it was just so dumb of me. And I've already had a few properties by then. So I don't know what I was thinking. I think I got into like FOMO mode or something, but Brisbane was all the hype back in 2015, 16, right? Um, So yeah, the dumbest thing that I've done is is probably that um, bought a sloping property into the house. In terms of what's uh, in terms of not being able to do much on the land, your issues with well, water. Well, you can't do what anything else? on the land. The like when it floods, in it's not in the flood zone, but the drainage is problematic. Of the water goes in on the driveway towards the the house, and it pool it goes through the it's a, it's a high set house. It goes through the garage into the backyard, and it just pools there. It stinks, and it causes all sorts of issues. So your property manager didn't notice that. Well, it was, they did actually, <laughs> they're, they're, they're the ones who were saying like, I don't, you think you should buy on the other side of this road. And I was just so much in FOMO. I was like, cause I think I was getting a quote unquote good deal at the time, but it was a lesson to be learned. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, PK. So, so much so good to come on, mate. And uh, appreciate your sort of the banter and the back and forth. Cause, um, I'd love to keep challenging you on the income growth. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's make that offline. It, I think we should do a challenge ourselves, right? Only time will tell, and that's the problem. You know, when you yes, particularly when you're pitching that the short term growth is what matters, you go yeah, and then but keep it for the long term. You know, ten years time we're going to come back, and then we can review all your examples, and um, and then we'll know whether you're right or not. Um, well, that's, I think that's the beauty of data that you can actually review it now based on ten years ago and back solving and reverse engineering, kind of back testing. The, the thesis on something 10 years ago? Well, yes, you can. That's a great use of data is obviously to see basically what has, has how has that pro- property performed in the past. However, you were also saying that, you know, you're buying in areas that are poised to have some short-term growth and potentially they may not have had it in the last 10 years. So that's not necessarily looking at the past predicting the future. So um, that's, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that really play, <laughs> that plays out as well as Maybe I'll have to get you guys onto my show or something and return the favor. But yeah, we can talk about, I, I can't claim that I bought there, but like Mount Druitt, Redfern, I did buy in Frankston. Like there's so many other examples, but that's for another time. Jolly good. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it, PK. Yes, thanks. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in an upcoming Q&A episode, you can send us a voicemail or written question via the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au, or you can email us directly at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. 
If you like what you're hearing, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars would be great. I know that sounds a bit cringy, but we have it on good authority that every review helps make it easier for other people to find out about us and hear what our amazing guests have to say.